Today's conversation is sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. If you're an accredited investor and you want to know about how we're helping other accredited investors keep more of their income, go to firstgencp.com forward slash going long. You don't invest in oil and gas for the tax benefits. However, if you don't acknowledge the tax benefits, you're not including a major benefit because roughly Uncle Sam's going to let you write off a third of what you invest. And, and so look at it this way. You, you make a half a million this year. You put 100000 in a drilling program. Well, now Uncle Sam looks at it like you made 410000 this year. You're listening to the Going Long Podcast with Billy Keels, the number one podcast for long distance real asset investing. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. And yes, I am your host, Billy Keels, and I am super excited to welcome you back to another amazing conversation. I'm going to jump right into this really quickly because you know what? Many of you have asked, how can you find previous episodes? Go to firstgencp.com forward slash podcast. You can find every single episode, video version, audio version, transcripts, and it'll be awesome. Also, listen, one of the ways we continue to grow is because you continue to share your honest written reviews as well as ratings. If you could continue to do that, or if you feel more comfortable just like posting on social media or sharing this across social media and letting people know how the Going Long Podcast is really helping you, that would also be very well appreciated. From there, I want to talk to you about today's conversation. We're going to jump into a topic that we've not really spent a lot of time talking to, uh, talking about here, but we may start doing more of this kind of stuff in the future. But today we are going to learn more about the energy space, specifically in the exploration of, of oil and gas. Uh, you're going to learn more about oil and gas business. You're going to hear more about the, what is shale and what are some of the different types of wells and, and also why are there are so many benefits to this from a also not just an investing perspective, but also there's some pretty unique investment opportunities or a investment uh, tax benefits as well that you may want to find out more. Because today's guest, Mr. RJ Burr, we're going to get to that in just a couple of seconds right after this. Are you a busy high paid professional? Someone that in the previous two years has earned $200,000 and is expected to earn $200,000 this year? Or maybe if you filed jointly, previously you've earned $300,000 the previous two years and you're also expected to do that this year. Or maybe if not, either individually or, or jointly, you have a million dollars in net worth, not including your primary residence. If you meet any of these criteria, then you're someone that the IRS considers to be an accredited investor. That probably means you're someone like an enterprise software sales executive. You may be an executive in a major corporation. You may be a doctor. You may be a lawyer, maybe a high paid consultant. You may even work for a major sports franchise. The thing I know you have in common is that you continue to do the hard work. Like you're doing 100% of the work and you're only bringing home 50% of the reward because you continue to get crushed by your income taxes. If you are tired of this situation and you're looking for a new solution, then go to firstgencp.com forward slash going long. When you get there, that's going to help you to start the journey so that you can begin to take back control of your taxes, take control of your time. And then also that means you're going to be able to spend more of the time that you want with the people that you love the most. And that is the way that you're going to get the personal freedom that you're looking for. So if you're looking to take back control, go ahead and go to firstgencp.com forward slash going long and see how we can help you today. So if you want to understand how to put a little bit more energy into your long distance investing strategy, then guess what? Today's the conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very last word. You know why? Because we've got an amazing guest and today's guest not only has spent literally a lifetime living and breathing energy. I'm sure he's going to tell us about that. He's also second generation of a family that continues to add loads of value to many people around the globe. And he has all he spent almost three decades. And for those of you that are watching on the video, you're not even going to believe it's almost been three decades as the senior vice president of field operations of Panex. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. RJ Burr. RJ, welcome to the show, man. Ah, good morning to you. Everything going all right? Yeah, everything's going just fantastic. And I'm really, really looking forward to a very unique conversation, one that I think needs a lot more attention and a lot more uh, spotlight. And you are just the person to help to educate us so we can learn more uh, about the uh, the energy space and some specific areas within the energy space, because I know it's pretty vast. Um, and I'm ready to get started, man. You can Terrific. jump right into it. All right, perfect. Absolutely. You, all right, RJ, as you know, you're going to get five questions. You're going to get two in the beginning. You're going to get three of them in the end. 
And then you're going to get a lot more questions in the middle. The thing is, I just don't know what those questions are. It's really going to be based on kind of what we're talking about. So we like to keep it free flow here. And I know you like that. So we'll be good with that. Um, and I want to just ask you first and foremost, help us understand where is it that you live in the U.S.? We are in Bowling Green, Kentucky. It's uh, basically about an hour north of Nashville, an hour and a half south of Louisville. And basically, and it's the triangle between Louisville, Lexington, and Nashville. It's uh, dead in the heart of the bluegrass state. All right. So some people, uh, home of the Corvette. Some people get to be uh, the peach capital of the world. We get to be home of the Corvette. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Well, I'm a Buckeye, so just up north, and uh, which is absolutely fantastic. So... Helping us understand from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Now the next question is, what is the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours, RJ? You know, I, I was thinking about that. And when Rush Limbaugh was one of my favorites, he, he gave, uh, you know, you don't have to agree with everything he said, but the way he phrased things and the way he made things understandable, it, it, it really, to answer your question, it takes courage to be positive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to get up every morning and be negative about something. It, any, any one of us could find something right off the bat, probably three or four things that we could complain about as soon as we get up. Well, it, it takes courage to stand up, find something to be positive about and go get it. What I'm positive about today is that I'm breathing, is that my family's healthy, that uh, everybody's doing well. And amongst all this chaos, we have a game plan to, to work through it. You know, also, too, there many times we tend to look for like, what's the most amazingly spectacular thing that's happened in the last 24 hours? And and when you have the ability to recognize that it's the simple things, the fact that you woke up this morning, the fact that you're healthy, the fact that you have your family with you that that loves you and supports you. Those things are the things that we should never forget. So I appreciate you providing us with that reminder and getting us started out with some positivity. And then I'm going to also ask you, listen. RJ, I try to do things sometimes that are like beyond this scope of reality because I like to keep the bar set really, really high. That means sometimes I do things that are really impossible to do. And so I'm hoping you forgive me because I tried to tell your entire like life story in two and a half seconds with the quick intro. Never going to happen, right? So because you've done <laughs> way too much, you've done too much, you've impacted too many lives positively. And you know what? I'm going to not only ask for a little bit of forgiveness for that, but also I'm going to ask for your help because what I would love for you to do is share your story in your own words. And you can take a lot more than two and a half seconds so that the going along family gets to understand a little bit more about you and your backstory. And then from there, we'll see where the conversation takes us. All right. Well, basically it, it's pretty simple. Um, some kids got to grow up watching their dads practice law. Uh, some got to grow up watching their dads practice medicine. I got to watch my dad in the oil and gas business. Uh, that, this is all I, I've ever known. I was on my first rig at seven years old, uh, earned my first partner and funded my first deal three weeks out of high school, made my first sale and, and have been doing it ever since. And there's really a, in my my family's life, there's been, we call it our first life in oil and our second life. in oil. Mm -hmm. And our first life in oil, I was the kid, uh, pounding, you know, back in the old days, it, it really doesn't work like that anymore. But, uh, Heck, I can remember days when we'd pound the phone a thousand, fifteen hundred times a day, making dials, smiling and dollar, raising money for drilling programs. Mm -hmm. And so that's really where I cut my teeth. Uh, when you look at Panex uh, and you look at the company here, the majority of the people in this office, and we're not a big operation, there, there's less than 10 people in our in our operation. And when you look at the vast majority of the people here, most of us are in between 42 and 52 years old. Well, we cut our teeth in the most ruthless stage oil and gas ever had. And that was the end of the J.R. Ewing. Year. And, and so that that was really where we cut our teeth. And then, oh, here about 10 years ago, uh, you know, that old saying that made us an offer we couldn't refuse. Uh, we drilled some wells with Marathon Oil and had some tremendous success. I mean, these wells were some significant wells. And uh, Marathon came back. They had plans of going deeper. They, they you know, had some things that really worked for their financial bottom line, but didn't work for ours. It, it was just something that our, we couldn't, uh, it, it didn't make sense for us to do it. And so we, we, did, we declined. And when we declined, uh, you know that old saying, they made us an offer we couldn't refuse. They came in and bought the whole company. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that was our first life in oil. And so here about, uh, 
oh, it was about five, six years ago, five years ago. Uh, me, my dad, my brother, uh, Chris, we we're, we we're sitting down talking. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, Billy, but man, I got tired of chasing that golf ball around the course. <laughs> you know, there, there's only, I, you know, I, I love yeah. making my partner's money. I love making money. And so we're kind of sitting there and, and we just made the decision. It's time. It's time for us to crank up and get going again. Yeah. And uh, so that's what we did. We, we cranked up and uh, started Pan X. Now, in, in our company's story, and this is not something, you know, and you, you really don't want to sound like a braggart. You, know, you really don't want to sound like you're, you know, egotistical. But to, to put it in proper context, this was a plan. Where, where mm-hmm. we're sitting today is not something that just happened by accident. Now, we, we weren't exactly sure of the route we would take to get to where we're at, but we knew the possibility was there. And, and what I mean by that is here about four years ago, we saw a crash in oil prices coming. And, and to, to understand the, the full picture of what we saw, if you walk out and talk to the average American and, and just said, hey, Name me an oil and gas company in America, an American oil and gas company. They're immediately going to go to Exxon. They're going to go to, to your large majors. Well, that's truly not the oil and gas industry in the United States. Hmm. They might have American companies stamped next to their name, but Exxon's an international company. They're, they're, they're beholden to their stockholders, not to what's best for America. And I have no problem with that. Let Exxon be Exxon. However, by putting in in the American oil company picture, it distorts the picture because 83% of your oil and 90% of your natural gas is produced by roughly 9,000 independent oil and gas companies. And these companies average 12 employees or less. Well, that's your oil industry. Now, knowing our track record, I remember raising money on programs and oil was $8 a barrel. And so wow. the last 20 years, oil's averaged $60 a barrel. And so when you look at the full scope of the American oil industry, the vast majority of those companies built their world around that $60 price. Now, chances are they needed $50 to $55 just to pay their bills. Right. They made their profit on that last $5. Well, whether you like Trump or not is really irrelevant in this conversation because what he did is he changed the power structure in the oil and gas industry. In 1960, the power in oil was the Seven Sisters, your seven major companies that really set, controlled, manipulated. They were the oil and gas market. They determined what everybody paid. Well, then OPEC was formed. Well, OPEC was formed as a counter to the Seven Sisters. And that has essentially been the power structure for the last 60 years. Well, then all of a sudden, President Trump came in and our shale areas exploded. And by America producing so much oil, it really took the power that OPEC had and diminished it. And that's what we saw. We saw that they didn't like it. And we saw OPEC plus, OPEC plus Russia, Saudi Arabia and Russia. We saw them, for lack of a better term, they entered economic war against the U.S. oil industry. Because what we saw happening, we saw them flooding the market with oil, pushing the price down. Well, if they push the price from 60 to 40 and all of these American companies need 50 or 55 to pay their bills, they put them in a bad spot. Now, the dirty little secret is, is Russia and Saudi Arabia need $50 a barrel also. However, we were willing to bet that they thought they could outlast the shale companies. And so that, that was what we saw. We knew there were going to be some buying opportunities. We thought it'd take 12 to 18 months to play out. And so that's really what we were getting ready for. Well, then Corona hit. Now, if anybody ever tells you they saw Corona coming, they're lying to you. <laughs> and so when Corona hit, what it did really for our industry is it took that 12 to 18 month period and crunched it down into 30 days. Well, there were three waves of damage that were done. The first wave was on April 20th when prices crashed. I mean, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I walk in my office sitting at my desk and I'm, I'm watching I Fox Business is on and I can see the oil price dropping. 20, 18, 17. When it got to 12, no, I think it was maybe 10. When it got to 10, I'd had enough. I couldn't watch anymore. And so I got up, literally went a block and a half down the road, went to Arby's, got me a roast beef sandwich and came back. I'm walking in my office. I look at the TV and I see 40. 
I'm like, oh, okay, good. It corrected. I mean, man, awesome. Good deal. And so I said, well, by the time I got from my door to my desk and sat down, it dawned on me, hang on, there was a little line in front of that 40. And it was at negative 40. Negative, right. I didn't even think that was possible. I've been in the oil business almost 40 years now. Yep. Or almost 30 years now. I, I didn't even think that was possible. Well, I guess if I was on my first rig at seven, I guess I'm 47. So I guess it's 40 years now. But I've been earning my living for almost 30 years and all. Right. But I didn't, you know, I, I didn't even think that was possible. And, and so what that initially did, that was your first wave of companies that got wiped out. The companies that weren't financially ready, weren't financially solvent, they were immediately wiped out because everybody essentially had to shut in production. Well, then you had your mid companies and your majors, the mid companies were the next wave because they sent all their workers home and then we paid them to keep them at home. All of a sudden, the company wasn't in trouble. Now they are in trouble. And, and so that's what we saw. And, and so during that process, we started acquiring properties. Right now, we have uh, roughly 3,000 acres on a salt dome in Louisiana. There, there could be 100 million barrels in there. I mean, it, it's, and we picked it up for pennies on the dollar. Now, that doesn't mean there's no risk. We got to go out and drill the wells. I mean, everything about oil and gas is speculative. If they ever tell you different, they're lying to you. But now, what we can do, and really what this does for my partners, you, you talk real assets. Yep. And, and this is where it really hits home because a large percentage of my partners are real estate investors, are gold investors, are silver investors, are asset investors. Mm -hmm. And so now you had a concurring storyline that's happening at the same time. Remember when there was that run on silver and yep. everybody was short in silver and all of a sudden people realized, whoa, there's much more paper silver than there actually is silver. silver yeah. Well, most investors live from three piles of money. Their first pile of money is their safe money. That's the money they pay their bills with. That's the money they take care of their family with, they eat with. That is sacred money. Nobody touches that money. Their second pile of money, that's their saved money. That's the money that when they park it there, they want to make sure, don't get me wrong, they want to make some money on it, but that's not the main goal. Main goal is when they go back to that pile, they want just as much or more to be there. That's where they buy their gold. That's where they buy their real estate. That's where they, that's where they handle that side of the, their money pile. Well, their third pile is their speculation pile. That, that's the pile that they're wanting to make multiples on it. That's typically the pile that the partners play with me on. That, that's their oil and gas pile. Well, all of a sudden, when that silver crunch happened, a lot of my partners realized that that pile in the middle, their safe pile, was just as manipulated as everything else. And so they started freaking out. And, and so I, it literally, and it weighed on me. I'm, I'm laying in bed one night and it was about three in the morning, it hit me. And, and I popped up and I said, whoa. Other than oil, other than water, medicine, oxygen, and food. Other than those four things, name one thing on the planet in more demand than oil. Now, the beauty of oil is you have half the population that want it free. You have the other half the population that wanted a million dollars a barrel. And so you have two equally opposing forces pulling on every dollar. Well, if you can pull your money out of the rat race and park it in an asset that you know is going to have a true value, then you can bypass all the craziness that's going on right now. Because look, doesn't matter what you, I mean, heck, y'all are dealing with it right now in Europe. I mean, when, yeah, and don't get me wrong, I want to preface this statement by saying I believe there's a little green in all of us. We, we all want yeah. beautiful environments and pristine conditions, but what we want and what is are two different things. And, and right now, Europe's about to face. And we're right behind you. Mm -hmm. to face what happens when you don't utilize hydrocarbons. And it's kind of scary. It's got a little long-winded there, but uh, in a nutshell, that's my story. No, not at all. And so, RJ, and there's a number of things that you've hit on, right? Because th some of the, the, the things that you're talking about may be brand new for, for some, uh, from some of our viewers, some of our listeners. But at the same time, I like to pull out a couple of things that you, that you said. One, I just want to be the going along family to understand that before you said, like when you talked about the second time, uh, your second life in oil, as you called it, the first thing you said is that you wanted to, that you enjoyed being able to help your partners make money. That was the first thing that you said. And that has a lot to do with the mindset, right? Because it is true. Once you're just not, you, you, you don't have to do anything else. And you think about the positive impact that you can make on others. 
And knowing that you have that mindset, because that's the very first thing that you talked about, I think is fantastic. Secondly, you talked about something that I don't necessarily know that many of our viewers or listeners are aware of. So I want to, I want you to maybe tie this in because you talked about shale. Um, but before we even do that, and this is just something that, cause I have conversations about this all the time. We talk a lot about, um, and I'm going to specifically talk about oil and gas or maybe oil specifically, because a lot of times when people hear and we talk about oil specifically, we think about how, how we can, you know, it's a similar thing, right? I don't care if you're red or you're blue, but everybody likes to do things in a greener way. But typically what I've found RJ is when we haven't been as informed as you are, when we talk about oil, we think about transportation, right? And using oil as a, as a method of transportation, but I think that there's a whole part of oil that people are forgetting about that um, actually has a day-to-day impact on their life. So if you could maybe give us the scope of maybe truly what what oil does impact on a day-to-day basis, and then mm-hmm. it, if you could talk to us also too about how, what, is, what is shale and how does that actually play into the picture? Okay. Well, probably the easiest way now... For somebody sitting here listening that, you know, chances are you're not taking notes. Not The easiest way to immerse yourself and get a foundation knowledge of oil and gas, go to our website, uh, panx.us slash learn. And on that page, you'll have oil and gas 101. It's a document we put together that basically gives you the foundation of oil and gas, how it started, how we produce it, what you're trying to do when you're drilled. It just gives you a rudimentary 101 level understanding of oil and gas. Uh, oil and gas 102 is basically the history of oil and gas, where we were, where we are, where we're going. And, uh, or no, the uh, oil and gas 102 is the taxes. Heck, Ali, I completely, <laughs> that's the, ta- the uh, 102 we're, is the taxes. We're, we're, don't worry, we're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> so, get to that but too. That, that's, the, that's the best way to, that I could give, to give you a, a full foundation of it. Now, gotcha. to, to answer your question on, that is really, I, I, I love movies. And one of my favorite movies is The Usual Suspects. And one of my favorite lines in that movie is the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And so I, I look at oil and gas and I kind of modify that statement and said the greatest trick environmentalist ever pulled was convincing the world that oil and gas was bad. Because it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what your education level is. Oil and gas drive every economy on the planet. Without energy, you're in the Stone Age. There, there's a, I saw a news report yesterday with a little city outside of uh, Berlin that's going and cutting down their own wood to burn it. They that's call small. it biofuel, but a tree's a tree. Wood's wood. You're burning wood. They did that back in the medieval days. You mean to tell me that's where we are today? No. And so what has happened is you have a group of people that, while I will never question somebody's motives, I don't know why they did it. I don't know what their gain was. I I have a pretty good idea and I have my opinions. However, there's nothing based in facts. It's just feelings. And and so you, you have a group of individuals that, for whatever reason, began a crusade to eliminate oil from our lives. And this is not something that's happened over the last five years. It's been going on for 50 years now. And when you do that, the quickest way for a third world country to become first world is a modern energy grid. Because your energy grid powers everything you do. Now, when it comes to oil and its day-to-day real world impact, everything. If you live in the modern world, you're in the oil and gas business. Whether you want to be or not, you're a consumer. We are all consumers. I try to give my partners a way to flip that money flow around and be a producer at the same time because plastics, medicine, asphalt, gasoline. I mean, the, well, in fact, if you go to when you, when you, panics.us, I have a full, there are several thousand products that can be made from one barrel of oil. And, and so it's just, uh, it's overwhelming. And, and that's the greatest injustice that's happened is the lack of education on, you know, when, when you turn your faucet on and water comes out, there's not somebody outside your house with a bucket of water pouring it through there. It runs through a piping system. 
there's a whole, and we don't understand that. We, we just take it for granted that it's there. You know, you look for the push for electric batteries. Do you realize what that would do to the energy grid in the United States? I mean, California is pushing by 2035. Virginia is pushing by 2035 to be all electric vehicles. We don't have, California is having roaming blackouts today. Hmm. Do you know what's going to happen to their electric grid when they have that much more being produced to charge? Like, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And, and so what we really try to do is, is you ignore the fluff. You, you ignore, prime, I teach my kids. When you're in a debate with somebody, stick with facts. The minute the words I feel are mentioned, you want it. Emotions have nothing to do with facts. Uh, emotions have nothing to do. Now, emotions play into a lot of the decisions we make because it's yeah, very strong. Sure. However, if you're able to divorce yourself from emotion and just look at one plus one will always equal two, never 2.1, never 1.9. It'll always equal two. And that is a truth. Well, two doesn't care what you think about it. It is what it is. And so the minute you say, well, I feel two should be 2.1. That's unfair to the 1.9. Well, you just lost the argument because you just violated a truth. And so if you ignore all the fluff, understand, I want modern technology. I, I, I would love to, the minute an electric vehicle does more for me than my Dodge diesel, I'll get an electric vehicle. But right now it doesn't. And you can't force me to do it. Now, you can put conditions where it's so painful that I have to do it, but I'm going to resent it every step of the way. And, and so you just kind of... You have to look through and see what is. Well, what is, is we are a world addicted to hydrocarbons. Natural gas, if you really wanted to be green, natural gas and nuclear are the cleanest burning energies we have. I mean, that, that it's a fact. Now, America, we're fortunate. We're the Saudi Arabia natural gas. Yet we're choosing not to do it. Not to, you You know, may, it kind of makes you scratch your head and say, hmm, if... If I have a pond full of fish and my people are starving, yet I'm making them go pick berries off dried out trees and not letting them eat the fish, that seems like I'm intentionally hurting my people. Well, same thing here. We have an abundance of natural gas. We have an abundance of energy worldwide. I mean, look at the modern world. There should not be one starving person on the planet. But why is there? It's because, man, I, it kind of makes you scratch your head. I'm not going to go down yeah, a consi consi it, but it's just, it, it, it just, it, so you accept what is, you see it, and then you make your plans for it. Like yeah, we knew there was going to be a shortage of oil. We knew the price, the price had to go up. So we made, prepare, we made a, a plan and took action. And, and you know, so the, the thing that is th that w when I hear you mentioning the different aspects, right? So there is the transportation aspect, which I think a lot of people think about when they think about oil specifically, that it goes from one point to the next point. But to the other point that you were talking about is there's the question of scalability of other types of, of sources of energy. And as well as today, just the number of different things that we are continue to be dependent on as byproducts of, uh, of oil that I think a lot of times we don't think about uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but in some of those things that you've highlighted, you know, if you think about the paint on your wall or think about people's glasses or think oh, about, we're, we're uh, about even to start cameras. About it. So, so these are, yeah. So these are a lot of the other things that you're helping to bring to light, which is very useful because then it, it, it grows from a macro level of what is this to also micro level is how would this, you know, affect me and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, the things that I see around uh, the, the, and, and, and things like that. Trusting that you're enjoying today's conversation. And you know what? If you're tired of getting crushed by taxes and you're looking for greater freedom to be able to choose what you want to do when you want to do it, make sure that you go to firstgencp.com forward slash going long and see how we can help you today. Let's get back to the conversation. There's another part of the question, which was the whole question of shale. What exactly is that, RJ? Because many people don't, are still not even really clear what maybe the oil is coming from. So particularly what is shale and why is that important to understand? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, well, it, it, it's basically oil is held under the ground and go to a gas station. You see a water puddle there. You see the rainbow sitting on top of it. That's your oil. And so it just by the laws of physics, when you have water in the ground, oil is going to sit on top of it. Well, that oil is going to flow through the ground through the path of least resistance. 
whether it's through fractures, whether it's through porous rocks, it's going to flow through until something stops it. And when that something stops it, your oil begins to pull. Pool. Well, if that water's pushing it and it has a trap, boom, now you have a pressurized pool. Well, that's what you produce the oil from. Now, that little formation, you can have, there's what's called matrix porosity, which is, uh, think of a lake. And matrix porosity, it's a, it's a big lake, and that lake holds the oil. You go in the middle, drill the first well, you go north, south, east, west, you keep stepping out, and you develop the entire lake. Well, then you have fractured porosity. Fractured porosity is essentially a river. Take a, take a gunny sack, put a big old cinder block in it, smash it up with a sledgehammer and dump it out. Those cracks between the blocks, that's what holds the oil and gas. And, and so there, there's different. And what your shale is, is essentially one of those subsets of it's a trapped formation. Now, it's, I mean, this is getting really in the weeds on the quality of oil and what they have to do to produce it, you know, with the fracking. And so there's a whole secondary, second level of knowledge that goes into specifically how you produce it and all that. Needless to say, it was just a oil bearing formation that we figured out how to produce. Perfect. And that is it. When, when they want to go to the 202 or the 502 class, they're going to contact you directly. And you yeah, just give me, yeah, give me a call. I have no problem with that. You, right. you take them down that route. So, so here's the other thing that I, I'm curious because <clears throat> energy is also something that needs to be produced. And a lot of times for those people that have had even a limited exposure uh, to the energy sector, they've heard about, well, you know, the... The, the government doesn't want to do all that. And so because of that, or they can't do all of it. And, and because of that, it's like most things, if the government doesn't want to do it, they will provide some type of incentive for others to do it. So maybe you could talk a little bit about why someone who has only thought about, maybe just thought about multifamily real estate, or maybe they've thought about mobile home parks, or maybe they've thought about ATM machines, but there's, they really want to build out more vehicles in their investment portfolio to help them get to the destination is the thing that I like to talk about. I don't believe that there is any one perfect investment vehicle, right? There's, there's, how do you combine these different vehicles to get you to your destination? Help us understand what is, how would this potentially fit into our investment portfolio and, and where, where would we look to, to see why the government is actually incentivizing people to help? Well, and, uh, 1986, the tax code was changed and they changed the tax benefits for, for oil and gas wells. And uh, to this day, it's still, in my opinion, the best tax benefit out there for any investor. It, it's an above line deduction. It's basically the intangible drilling cost. Uh, put it to you this way. If, if my partners come in, let's say they put 100000 in a drilling program. Well, year number one, they're going to write off roughly 90% of their initial investment Basically, take their now. I'm not a CPA. I'm just kind of give you yeah. a rule of thumb. Uh, well, let me yeah, I was going to say. Let me let, here, let me let me let me let me do that for you, RJ. So everybody, I'm asking RJ a question. What he is doing is sharing his experience, and we've got almost three decades of experience. He, he in no way is giving anyone any tax advice. He is going to talk to you about examples. He's going to talk to you about things that he has seen. Uh, but you need to do your own due diligence. Speak to your own tax professional. Speak to your own team to understand about how some of these ideas that he's talking about would fit your specific situation. So, with that stated, uh, RJ, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that. The IDC. You didn't say IDC, but um, the uh, the the IDC concept. Concept, maybe what that is, and then also how that uh, plays into based on the things that you've seen. Okay. Well, I, I'll even take your statement one step further. It, if my partners get to the point that they want to get any more in the weeds on the, the oil and gas taxes, that's when I step out and I bring the our, our accountant and our CPA, and I let the two CPAs te- talk CPA to each other. Yeah, it makes and, sense. And so, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Because <laughs> you, you don't do oil and gas for the tax benefits. I, I had a partner a long time ago. I looked at him and said, well, Mr. Johnson, you, you get to write off thirty-five thousand. I said, "Boy, if I wanted to write off, I'd give it to the Boy Scouts." And, and so, you know, I, I didn't do that. So, you you don't invest in oil and gas for the tax benefits. However, if you don't acknowledge the tax benefits, you're you're not including a major benefit because roughly Uncle Sam's going to let you write off a third of what you invest. And, and so, look at it this way: you you make a half a million this year, you put a hundred thousand in a drilling program. Well, now Uncle Sam looks at it like you made four hundred ten thousand a year. This year, it's going to be about a thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars above line deduction. You owe them one hundred fifty thousand. Now you owe them one hundred twenty thousand. 
That that's the basic sum of. Now, once again, it applies differently to everybody. Yep. But what that tells me right there, just the act that they did it, and the fact you see all this chaos going on. Have they touched the taxes on the drill on drilling and oil and gas? No, because they know how much we need it. I mean, they if you eliminate your oil and gas, I mean. When we talk about you know green energy, and I don't want to bust any green energy bubbles, but do you realize ninety five and a half percent of all of America's energy is created by natural gas and coal? It's not green. Four and a half percent is green energy, and, and so the technology is not there. That's not the uh, you know like I said, I believe there's a little green in all of us. Hmm. How, however, the te- it's been my experience that it, it, it's going to take a printing press type invention. It's going to take, you know, somebody reinventing the wheel and human nature tells me that if somebody had already done it, we'd know about it because they'd be standing on top of the mountain telling everybody about it. And so you just don't see that. I don't see it in the near future. Now, if it does, terrific. However, once again, we bet on what is not what we hope. And so we look at the facts now when it comes to uh, really prospering in this moment. Because the key to it, when you invest in oil and gas, because we're, we're talking about vehicles in which they could, mm-hmm. typically what we do is drilling partnerships. We, we'll, we'll pair together a number of wells to, to spread the risk around. Just because if you put all your eggs in one basket and drill one well, like I said a minute ago, this is oil and gas. Anything can happen. We're drilling a well. You know, only truly the good Lord above knows exactly what's down there. Yep. And, and so we, we start drilling. So we'll typically put multiple wells together. And, uh, and then drill those wells. Now, prime example, uh, I just sent out revenue to my partners, what, today's Wednesday, so Monday. My partner's on two of the wells we just drilled. In fact, uh, we were down uh, in, uh, in Belize when we were putting these wells in production with, uh, on the, the summit on the sand. And uh, we were putting these wells in production. We had about, a, oh, there were probably about 100 partners of ours right there. I mean, we're on stage. We're there seeing live. We put live video wherever. All our partners can log in and see what we're doing in the field where, you know, this is your money we're talking about. Mm-hmm. We want you to know where every dime is and what we're doing. And so we're putting these wells online while we're sitting there. Well, our first distribution to the partners for 30 days of production, the wells produced almost $800,000 in 30 days. And, and so, and these aren't, we're not even producing from the big zones. We're not even producing, we're just producing from the deepest zones. That's, Typically, you start deep and work your way up. And so that's what these partners invest in. Their, their first check on that uh, unit price was 100000 I believe that their first check was right at $4,000 for one month's worth of production. You know, And, and so now, is that going to stay there? Well, it depends on what oil price is in. depends on how much the wells produce. But what you have, if you were successful on a drilling program, I'll give you, let's just say, Billy, you came and you put 100000 in my drilling program. Let's say we start drilling September 1st. So we start drilling. It's going to take us roughly three weeks to a month and a half to drill the well. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's say it just takes a month. We start drilling September 1st. We're done by the end of September. October, we start putting the well in production. Well, we start selling oil. Now, we have a good idea what the well is going to generate because we have it in production. We see the daily rates. Well, what will happen from that point? It typically takes about two to three weeks to complete the well. So now you're at the mid to end of October. Well, now it's in production and selling. Well, from the day it starts selling, you will typically see anywhere from 30 to 45 days before they pick up their first load, pick up the tanks. Basically, they come and upload it from the tanks into the tanker and they purchase it. So you invest September 1st, you would see your first revenue would probably be January. Now, once that revenue started, it would come every month for as long as the well is producing. Gotcha. Now, these wells, these wells that we just sent the revenue on, there's 15 zones in one of these wells. That well could be producing for the next 30 years. And you'll own a piece of everything it produces for the next 30 years. And so a lot of that then, RJ, for someone who's looking at that, when they ask about the, you know, what is the price of oil and which, type is, you know, are we looking at uh, WTI? Are we looking at Brent? Are we looking at different types of oil? Like, is that then the production? Is it based on what the price of the oil would be at a, at a particular point in time over that 30 year period that you just talked about just for someone who oh, has yeah. no it, idea. Yeah. It, I, and I sit down and I run the numbers with their, you know, one of the things I love doing and it's, it's 
actually a fun part of my work is I ha- have you grab a scra- hey, grab a piece of paper and pencil. Let me show you how I run the numbers. That way you can take any amount of production and you know how to work it out. And, and so then we'll sit down and I'll basically just pencil it through them and show them what the revenue is. And basically, yeah, it depends on what your price per barrel is. It, it depends on how much it produced. And, and so, I mean, th- and that's the straight line of what your, what the well revenue will be. Now you have some lease operating expenses. You have some, but what we do is every, every month when we send revenue out, we send a complete breakdown out with it. That way you see how much the well produced over this time period, what we average per price of barrel, what the LOEs are, and what's your piece of the revenue is. I mean, we break it all out because once again, this is, this is your money we're talking about. Yeah. When and, you say uh, LOE, when you, for the person who may not understand LOE, what do you mean by that? Oh, uh, lease operating expenses. Okay. Yeah, if you, you might have to come out and do some maintenance on the wells. You might have... There might, there's going to be various things every month that you have to do to your wells. Perfect. And so RJ, there, there, and I appreciate you giving us more of the detail and kind of how that works. I just want to remember or want to remind everyone, and RJ talked about this in the beginning, typically you have your, you know, what is happening on a day-to-day basis. This is your, uh, your safe money. And then you have your save money. And then as you talked about, this is the people that you're typically working with. This is their third bucket. The, the, the speculative buck, bucket, I think is what, what you call it or the speculating bucket typically. Right. And so we know mm-hmm. that there's a lot of good things that happen and we, you know, I wouldn't be, this would, we wouldn't be doing everyone that's watching and listening to us justice if I didn't ask the question, right? Cause there's, this sounds like a lot of really great stuff. Where would be in your almost three decades of doing this, what are some of the different risk factors that someone would want to take into consideration as well? Oh, dry hole where you're drilling. What kind of prospect? Uh, what is that? What, what does that mean? My, what does that, what does that mean? When you say dry hole, what does that mean for somebody who has absolutely no idea what, what this is about? You drill a well and there is no oil there. It, it, you drill a well, there, there's no oil there. It's a dry hole. You lost other than your tax benefits. You lost every dime you drill. Gotcha. You, you, you cracked out, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Now, in typically how I tell my partners to look at it, this is oil and gas. And I, I've said, you know, there, there are no guarantees. If anybody ever calls you and guarantees you something, especially in oil and gas, they're lying to you. Hang up on it. Now, when it comes to financially suitability, now I'm not saying you'd be happy. If we had a dry hole and we lost everybody's money, nobody would be happy. Yeah. However, if that money would change the clothes you wear, the car you drive, or the food you eat, then it's not for you. You're not big enough to invest in oil and don't do it. And, and so that, you know, that's, that, that's kind of just the baseline where if that's something that if the world opened up and swallowed my company, we lost every dime we, you sent. If it changed your lifestyle, then no, you shouldn't do it. Yep. And, and I have no problem saying that, not, not backing up from one bit because this is a speculative business. Now, when it when it comes, when I say the types of wells you can drill, that that's really their their various types. Like your your wildcat wells. I'm sure everybody's heard the term wildcat wells. Well, a wildcat well is essentially a well going into the middle of an unproven area and trying to establish production for the first time. National averages, you're going to hit maybe one out of twenty. I mean, they're they're very very speculative. Now, once you hit that one well. Then you start developing your field and you'll drill your developmental wells. You'll go north, south, east, and west, Mm -hmm. and you'll keep drilling and stepping out until you find the boundaries of your productive area. Developmental wells, you're going to hit 50 to maybe 65% of those. Now, once you've established that field, then what you'll do is you'll come and you'll drill in field developmental wells. You'll go in between your producers. And uh, we kind of invented a term called closeology. You know, best geology you can get is closeology. Get as close as you can to a proven producer and drill another one. And, and so your infield developmental wells, you should hit, barring any technical drilling problems, you know the oil's there. You're not, you're not speculating. At that point, you've built a big enough picture where you know where the oil's at. And so, you know, take our Choctaw fields where we're, where we're drilling right now. We have two wells here and here. This well has 15 zones in it. This well has seven zones in it between them over 500 feet of pay. Well, if I come and drill two wells right here in between, what are the odds that these two wells shouldn't have at least some of what these two wells do? Hmm. That's the program we're funding right now. So gotcha. are these speculative wells? Yeah, we're, we're drilling. I mean, we're drilling on a salt dome. It can be, it can be some difficult drilling. So yeah, th- it's not a guarantee. However, if I'm going to put my partners in a position what better spot than put you dead in between two producing wells? 
And, and so that that's really why, you know, right now, and look at it, every industry, name me an industry that's thriving. Every industry, it seems to be battening down the hatches and, and getting ready to ride out a storm. Well, we've positioned ourselves where we don't have to. I mean, I, I, I'll put it, let, let's just say, let, let's just say, that we live in one of two worlds right now, Billy. Well, one of two. Either one, everything we see on a daily basis is true. All of these decisions that are being made, everything that has been going on is going to continue to go on. And we just have to accept that we are this corrupt. Well, if, if that's the case, oil prices are going to go to two, $300 a barrel. They're going to run them through the roof. Well, you know what? My partners own that oil. You think they're going to be happy making two, making that kind of money when oil prices shoot? So let's just say everything stays the way it is. My partners are sitting pretty. Well, let's say there is something going on underneath the surface. Let's say all of a sudden the adults re-enter the room and we start making wise economic decisions again. Prices say drop to 60, 70, 80 dollars a barrel. We have a $19 basis in this oil. My partners are still sitting pretty because hmm. the fact will never change. We are addicted to oil. Hmm. Now, how I look at it in America, I kind of look at our company. You realize there hasn't been a major oil and gas company created producing American oil in almost 50 years. Why not us? I, I look at all these guys we're competing with and man, we're sitting in a good position. We have a loaded gun and we're charging. And my goal by the end of this right now, we believe we're sitting on, oh, we estimate it could be anywhere from 70 to 100 million barrels of oil. Well, when we're done with it, with our acquisition phase, and that's, we're in the middle of it right now. We want to have a couple of billion barrels of oil in reserve. We have a strategy to do it. I'm not, I, I don't, uh, I don't lay my strategy out there for everybody because I, I don't want to entice competition. But are you, I mean, you with, we, we understand the field we're in. We understand the market we're facing. We understand the cost associated with producing the oil. But more importantly, we understand the industry. And we, we build the recipe to bake this cake. We build all of those variables in it. That way, if you control what you can control, I go back to what I teach my kids. Shame on me if I teach my kids something I'm not willing to do myself. Control what you can control. Yeah, control There's the only control. so many things that you can control. Well, let's control those. Then we'll deal with all the randomness that comes up along the road. And, and, and by approaching it in that way, we've shored up our base. We, we built our reserves. Our partner base is, they're tickled. Our, our partner base is tickled. And, and so we've just really put ourselves in a position where, uh, you know, once again, you don't want to, you don't want to sound like a braggart, but we're sitting pretty good. You know, and being in that strong position, RJ, it's one of these things that I just make me think, wow, you know, there's a, there's a lot for, I mean, you've talked about a lot of different things and we're going to recap that in just a second, but, um, you know what happens? We got to get to the going long final three, man. Nah. We really have to get to the going long final three. And the thing is, RJ, I never ask anyone. And today you're our special guest. I never ask anyone the going long final three, unless you tell me that you're ready for me to ask you. Are you ready? Right. Well, whatever you're ready. <laughs> you were born ready, man. Come on. Here yeah. we go. So listen, we started with you uh, in Bowling Green. I would like to bring things to my new adopted home side of the pond, even though I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. Everybody knows that already. But I would love for you to tell us, RJ, what is your favorite European city that you have either visited or is still on your bucket list to visit? Uh, you know, I, I think you got it. Now, I'll, I'll lean to my wife on this one just because I, I've never had business overseas. And so I, I, my eyes have never turned to the east. Now I have gone south, but they never turned to the east. Mm -hmm. But man, you'd have to say Paris, or I mean, you'd have to say Barcelona. You, you'd have to say, you know, Venice. You'd have to say some some of your iconic cult, you know, just because I love beauty. I, I love pretty things. So I will and, share this with you. I will we'll take Paris. I started a one year sabbatical twenty one years ago, 
in Paris and now live in Barcelona. I've been to Venice. It's fantastic. <laughs> but this whole thing started in Paris. It was just supposed to be one year and then I was supposed to go back. So we're going to take that one and we're going to go into question number two. And question number two really has a lot uh, to do with the, the good fortune that I've had, RJ, and, and really being able to come into contact with people who are, you know, people that are, are top producers, people that are um, really exceptional uh, at what they do. And so one of the things that I've always recognized, and hopefully you will agree with this as well, RJ, is that, you know, people that tend to um, perform at a really, really high level, they tend to come up with a plan. They tend to execute that plan perfectly the first time, which is what allows them to go much further and fat. I think I just got that wrong. No, I didn't get it wrong. RJ, it's kind of a joke. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of a joke. Nobody gets things right perfectly the first time, at least not normally. We call it, a, <laughs> a, a Bob Ross, a happy accident. <laughs> there you go. And they, you know, it's one of these things that happens. No, it's, it's, it's an inside joke. With me and the Going Long family, I do it all the time. It's one of these things. So, because it's, it's kind of ridiculous to think that people that are high performers are always doing things perfectly the first time. The reality is those that perform at a high level tend to... Um, make more mistakes than most people, a lot more mistakes. But the reality is, is those people that are high performers or those teams that are high performance, they do do think one thing very, very differently. It's that every single time that they make a relevant mistake, without a doubt, they stop. They learn from the mistake. And then what they do from there is they put different strategies, tactics, and actions in place to minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening again. So what I would love for you to share with the Going Long family is, what is the one lesson, not really the mistake, I don't want you to think about the mistake that you made, but what's the one lesson that you took away that you know is going to help somebody today minimize the probability of the exact same thing that happened to you that would happen to them? What's that one lesson? I was building a house. I was probably 27, 28 years old. And I'd never been in that area. I was always in oil and gas. I'd never engaged in anything like that. And I ended up getting just reamed. I think I lost 15, 20,000. I mean, it was, I, I, at that point in time, it was a, was big, a big hit deal. for big a 28 year old yeah. kid with a wife and kid. And, and so when it, the finale of that moment happened and, and it was done and I had accepted the loss, oh well, man, I, I'm a competitor and I'll fight a circle saw when I'm mad. And, and I was fuming. I mean, I, I was ready. I, I, was, I was mad. And uh, I pulled into my brother in law's house and he has a fellow named Jerry McKinney there. And Jerry McKinney, at one point in time, was the number one Oldsmobile salesman in the country based in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Still blows me away. I like throwing that fact out there because it blows me away that Jerry was able to do that in little old Bowling Green, Kentucky. And, and so anyway, I walk up and, I, I, and they asked me if I wanted a beer. And at that point in my life, I, I partook in alcohol. And uh, so I grab a beer and we're sitting there. And I mean, like, I, I'm angry. Mm. And Jerry looks at me and he says, Jay, I, I'm going to give you some advice. He said, are you okay with that? I said, sure, Jerry. He goes, ask me, ask your dad. He said, ask any successful person who has made money. Have you lost money? He said, every one of us has lost money. Yep. The question is, do you lose money the same way twice? And that was the lesson I learned from that. It, it uh, you know, I calmed down for a second took me a breath and then you move on. You, you take your legs, but you're, you're absolutely right. You must learn, you know, if I touch that socket, it's going to electrocute me. Well, guess what? If you touch the socket, don't be surprised when it electrocutes you. You know, you, you, what did uh, George Sadayama, if you don't learn from your past, you're doomed to repeat it. Yep. You know, we, history is cyclical. It really is. You go back to, uh, well, go back to where we're sitting right now. The, the reason we're sitting where we are right now is because we've learned from history. In, in every chaotic moment, in every moment of so-called crisis in our country, there have been a person or a group of people that came out of the other side looking like geniuses. And, and when you string all of their stories together, they really had two common traits that they each shared, because it's all in various industries. But the first common trait is they had cash on hand when the crisis hit. And the second one, they had the courage to push their chips into the middle of the table when the time was right. That's really the only two things that ties these together. And that's exactly what we saw. That, that's We had cash on hand and we pushed everything to the middle of the table. And so that's what we learned from our past. 
you got to make those uh, you got to make those big bets. And as you said, um, you know, don't uh, don't make the same mistake twice. Learn from the first time. So appreciate that. And this actually brings us to our last question. Our last question, RJ, which is really helping to feed the mind. And I know you like uh, you like your books and you like your knowledge. Um, so help us understand what's the one book that you would recommend to the Going Long family today? Atlas Shrugged. Period. And she she so nailed much, it. Yeah. What, 60, 70 years ago, exactly what's going on today. Yep. That one's easy. So well, Atlas, that, and, that and Think and Grow Rich. I was a big Think and Grow Rich also. Think, so, okay. But, well, I'm gonna t- we're going to take it, Atlas Shrugged. A little shorter reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, RJ, you know what? I, I cannot believe these conversations, they just fly by. And I'm thinking right from the very beginning, as you talked about other people, you know, some people watch their parents either as lawyers, as doctors. Some people have even watched our parents struggle at, early on in life, trying to figure out what they needed to do. And you have had the opportunity to learn firsthand what it was like. I think you even said at seven years old, you're out on your first rig. And uh, before you knew it, you were calling uh, at probably 17, 18, I think you said it, uh, making your first investor calls and, and helping under- people to understand mm-hmm. the, the investment opportunity that was there. You've not only lived one life, you've had the good fortune to be able to live two lives in, uh, in, in, the, in the oil and gas business, recognizing that you are also focused on how you can help others, those people that are looking specifically in that third bucket. I love the way that you phrase that. Like if it's going to change your life, the investments that you're making, probably not the right thing. If you are, it's probably nice to have people that have 30 plus years of experience uh, at the front line and then even a couple extra years uh, behind you and with your team, small team focused on being able to help people understand how the oil and gas business can be a beneficial part of their portfolio. All of these things, I know people have heard some of the stories you've talked about. You've helped us also to even understand the different types of wells, the wildcat development, uh, chalk talk, et cetera. And I know they're thinking, man, Billy, well, I know he's told us before, but how can he help us to understand how we can get in touch with him, find out more about what you're doing, RJ, as well as the team at Penix? How can we find out more? How can we be in touch? The easy way, my email address is rjburr at panex.us. Our, our website, and this would be the area where I would direct everybody because there, there'll be, don't take my word for it. I, you know, I, I, I've been in sales since I was knee high to a grasshopper. And, and so I tend to just present things in a salesman like term. Don't take my word for it. Go to, go to panex.us slash learn and click on our testimonials. Listen to what our clients have to say about us. That, that's the easiest way to see who we are. And uh, from there, you'll either want to talk to us about what we're doing or you won't. If you do, terrific. We'll, we'll talk to you. We'll sit down for however long you want to talk. For as many questions you have, do not hesitate. We work for you. If the little hair on your pinky toe has a question and you don't ask it, shame on you. That's what we're here for. And, and sit down because really it boils down. There are three factors involved for you and I'll ever do business. The first factor we kind of touched on it a little bit. It's the partner and his family's money. Are you in a position to do it? Well, once that factor's positive, we'll set it aside. Now it's on me and my two factors. First and foremost, RJ Burr, PanX, and our family. Are, are we the kind of people that you want to do business with? If you wouldn't be proud knowing I'm working for you, don't hire me. Now, the, the second that, once you see that we're the kind of people you want to do business with, the second one is, what are we doing? There are literally millions of places in this world where you can put your hard-earned investment dollars. Why is putting it with us something you should do? Now, when it's all said and done, if we have a positive on all three factors, we'll do business. If we have a negative on any one of them, and it can take any shape, form, or fashion you want, whether it's talk to my wife, talk to my accountant, talk to my lawyer, what, you know, it, it can take any shape you want, but it will, when you boil it back down, it will come to one of those three factors was negative. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really... All we look for is the opportunity. I, I love competing. I, I'm an old ball player. And, and so I love for somebody to say, well, my program's doing this. All right, we'll put a little piece with me and let me see if I can beat it. You know, that's what made America great. Yeah, but, uh, and then you can go, you can go to the panex.us slash learn, the testimonials. You, you can do the oil and gas 101. All of that is from the same spot. Okay. And so that'd all probably right. be the easiest way to, to begin your journey with us. All right. So we've got the email. Don't worry, everybody. We're going to make it really easy. We're going to put a link, a link there. So if you're running or you're jogging or you're in the car, all you have to do is click the link and they'll send them an email directly to RJ Burr. So, um, and with that also panx.us forward slash learn, and you can find out the investing 101. And, um, listen, man, 
I just would like to thank you very much, RJ, for deciding to invest your time with me and the entire Going Long family. And uh, thank you very much. Oh, Billy, I really appreciate it. Y'all have a good one. Uh, all right, perfect. And you give me just a second, RJ. I'm just going to wrap things up and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you get out of here. So listen. Oh, you're good. All right, perfect. So I'm going along, family. Listen, RJ just left it all here. He helped you. He gave you a masterclass in a couple of uh, minutes. And he's also giving you the opportunity to continue to learn more about how the oil and gas industry can be helpful to you. He's giving you the panx.us forward slash learn. You can go check that out. And you know what? You know, somebody needs to hear today's conversation. So make sure that you share today's conversation with somebody, follow up with them, take the, the theory, take the class that, uh, that, that RJ talked about and take your theory and start to put it into practice and, and heck, reach out to RJ and the team. But while you're doing that, I'm going to be here preparing for the next conversation. So until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Trust that you enjoyed today's conversation. And once again, today's conversation was sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. If you're an accredited investor and want to find out more about how we're helping accredited investors to gain their personal freedom even faster, go to firstgencp.com forward slash going long.